Okay, uh, we're going to start. Welcome uh, to the uh, to arguments lecture series. We're super happy uh, to have here today Simone Farrasin from Forma Fantasma. Uh, uh, he's going. Simone is work together with with uh, his pawn in Forma uh, in Forma Fantasma. Is he's really done a great, I would say, even revolution in the way design is being thought of, and the way also the relationship of objects. Uh, with larger systems, uh, it's uh, mobilized as part of the uh, design and debo. Um, uh, Oscar Arnorson is going to be presenting uh, Simone, and Jonah Rowan is going to uh, uh, be helping moderate the, the panel afterwards. Thank you, Andres. I am delighted to be here today uh, to introduce Simone Farasin, one of the designers of uh, Forma Fantasma. Simone and his partner Andrea Trimarci established their res research-based practice while at the Design Academy in Eindhoven in the Netherlands from where they graduated in 2009. Since then, they have produced in their Amsterdam studio a rich body of design work at the nexus of aesthetics, politics, and material culture for a number of clients and institutions, too many to enumerate here. Today we're here to discuss their multi-year uh, investigation into the recycling of electronic waste, uh, titled Ore Streams, developed over the course of three years, 2017 to 2019, and commissioned by NGV Australia and Triennale Milano. The title implies a flow of minerals above the surface of the earth as opposed to the molten materials of the Earth's crust. As your compelling narrator perceptibly points out in the beginning, this stream is purely anthropocentric. No other terrestrial life form, presumably, has removed minerals from the Earth and much less transformed them into something else. Correct me if I'm wrong. The stream therefore requires a process of human circulation, and these are slides from the film. Um, the stream therefore requires a process of human circulation at the moment human activity stops, for example, through mass distinction, this stream will cease. And over the course of million years, or millions of years, the metals will slowly sink back through the mantle into the Earth's core to be recirculated by some other extractive intelligent life form um, at a later point. On the surface, it all looks like these metals organize human activity. One might even be tempted to believe that they organize human activity just as much as human activity organizes them. And I, I show here this kind of terrifying uh, image that comes on at the point in the film when um, we are told that in 2009, uh, so-called smart objects, uh, uh, there were more smart objects in the world that there were, that there were people. So no wonder that historical periods used to be named after materials excavated from the earth, Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, or that entire monetary systems have been built up around the particular characteristics of particular metals, or uh, particular materials, often metals. Now to build on that, your film shows us that humans are more organized their, by their metals than ever before, and the image of the human pinging from one device to, the, to another, from the refrigerator, to the toaster, to the washing machine, machines that organize biological processes, cotton, um, wheat, um, bread, while also being signifiers of middle class life, is somehow horrifying. And uh, I, I return a little bit to this image because I, you almost start being able to see like the kind of the concentric nodes in this system, which uh, as almost these appliances and the humans kind of uh, kind of uh, circulating between uh, the appliances in a kind of a turn of the tables. Throughout the film, the engineer, architect, designer, wherever she appears, seems hopelessly complicit. If not a defining actor, then at best a figure almost as pliable as the metals she applies her designs to. Even so, at the end, you arrive at a fairly honest and straightforward plea for design and something like a positive mission where you claim that, and I quote, design can play a role. 
It is not just about shaping materials, but investigating and guiding what happens before that moment and from that point onwards. It can be a tool to limit and heal the damage caused by its needs, rather than a mechanism to invent new desires and immediately frustrates them. What you claim here, as well as in the thoughtful and sometimes almost prosaic uh, suggestions in the design strategies uh, film, such as, and I quote, designing objects with more intuitive connectors or clamping systems, which would enable a more precise separation of materials and more efficient recycling, is, and I unquote, um, is the image of a designer as the designer of the possible, able to revalue what is smart and what is dumb, what is waste, and what is efficient. A counterpoint to this is, to this incredibly ambitious vision, and its kind of more modest counterpart, are the design objects themselves, which I would love to hear more about today, since what all of us have been doing for today's lecture is pour over the films. These objects, they seem intentionally rarefied and restrained as critical objects. They're nothing like the kind of um, design for uh, the 90% uh, objects that one might encounter in an exhibition at, say, the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum. These desks and tables are not designed to change the world, let's put it that way. Rather, they seem to engage with the immediate context of the high-end showroom that they seem to so comfortably belong to in order to illustrate the very absurdity of the position within their being asked to perform. So I wanted to close with this image of the film, which filled us with despair in a kind of anti-technological sublime, to modify um, historian David Nye's term, because it shows an image of entropy. The image of the designer architect is sometimes hopefully described as someone who miraculously combats entropy by giving order to the world. But what this image shows is that matter is always preserved, to increase organiz organization in one part of the system, you must decrease it in another. Every design is therefore simultaneously a design of a whole somewhere else in the globe. Your work seems to call on us to acknowledge that as architects, we design cavities as much as we design objects. And the more awareness of this, the better designers we become, the better our planetary dental hygiene to complete the metaphor. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. And thank you for the introduction. Um, so today, I'm going to introduce you uh, Aura Streams. And I think in order to understand really the body of work I'm introducing, it's important that I frame it in the context of its commission. As it was mentioned by Oscar, it was a project commissioned by the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne, Australia, which is a museum, and the Triennale in Milan by Paola Antonelli, senior curator of the MoMA. But the initial request came from the National Gallery of Victoria, who came to us, the curatorial team, because they were interested in our research approach. Nevertheless, and these connect back to what you were mentioning regarding the objects, they gave us, in a way, a very open uh, brief, but we had to conclude it with a series of uh, furniture pieces. Well, this because the National Gallery of Victoria have a uh, policy of acquiring in their collection only furniture pieces. And this says a lot about the way design is still conceived even in public institutions. And nevertheless, because we understood the limitations but also the possibility of the commission, and we felt the institution also understood our way of working, we accepted their possibilities knowing that no matter what, we should have concluded with a series of furniture pieces. Um, I thought it was probably relevant today to do not uh, show only the conclusions of the work, but also where we started from. Because when we are approached a design studio with such a sort of vague uh, commission, what we do is always questioning, of course, what we are interested as designers, and also in which way we can apply design within a public institution. And what we thought was interesting about Australia is that it is one of the few first world countries which has the economy still largely based on the extraction of minerals. 
So the initial starting point for, for us as a studio, since we have always been interested in the complex relationship between design, the extraction of resources and the transformation to desirable products and the interaction with the environment, um, we thought this could be an important or interesting starting point, specifically the extraction of minerals from the underground. And in the presentation today, I include this picture of the Willamette meteorite, which is an iron nickel meteorite conserved at the uh, Natural History Museum in New York and was found at the beginning of the 20th century. We love this picture because it shows uh, great naivete and uh, we love to see these uh, young kids sit on top of a gigantic meteorite. Nevertheless, it also, at least for us, implicitly refer to the late veneer hypothesis, which says that basically the minerals we're actually mining in this moment came to exist in the planet, not because they are native to planet Earth, but because the rains of meteorites crashed against the planets and imported a layer thick of precious metals between others gold that veneered the, the planet and we are actually still mining. Somehow we feel that these extraterrestrial origins of metals somehow gives almost an existential quality of the, of the way we interact with the planet for production. We also looked into the development of knowledge of mining, and this is an illustration of Georgius Agricola, who was a German writer who, in the beginning uh, of the uh, 16th century, started writing several books, and in mid-16th century published the Metallica, which was the first book that largely, in a very precise way, analyzed the mining industry. And he was also the first person that mentioned the ecological implications of the mining industry and also the dangers for the laborer. We, of course, couldn't skip the observations, the um, ecological impact of mining and the notion of conflict minerals, which I guess you are all familiar with. Basically, are those minerals that are extracted, for instance, for the productions of uh, our phones or computers and so on, that because of their extraction, they are uh, causing armed conflicts in specific areas of the planet. We also looked into the economy and how it is structured the economy of metal um, refinement. And these pictures, for instance, are from the London Metal Exchange, where the prices of all ferrous metals are um, actually uh, decided daily. But the moment in which this sort of very broad and, in a way, generic analysis of the mining industry became much more focused on electronic waste was when we uh, read a post on a Business of Mining, which is a blog dedicated to uh, uh, people interested in the economy uh, around uh, mining, they stated that although the global demand for metals continue to increase, demand for mine supply actually starts to decrease slowly, with mining only accounting for 30-40% of the total supply in 2080, versus the 50-80% in the current situation. I mean, we will never know uh, how it will be in 2080. Nevertheless, it, a trend is clear, and I had a chance to also confirm this trend when we started engaging in conversation with a variety of practitioners connected to the recycling of uh, metals. Specifically, we decided to focus on electronic waste for several reasons. The first one is that in this moment, electronic waste is the fastest growing stream of waste globally, which means that, of course, it is not the, the largest, but it's the one growing uh, very quickly. And also because we, as designers, uh, we feel that our practice is tremendously shaped by digital tools. And we thought it was, in a way, very interesting to focus on the same object that allows even this research to happen to um, investigate really uh, what it means to uh, recycle electronics. I'm sure you are all familiar with the fact that the main driving force behind the recycling of electronics is the presence of precious metals contained in circuit boards. And you're also, I'm sure, very familiar with some of these pictures. Um, and we decided to include them, despite they are very um, known, of the dumping ground in Ghana or the uh, recycling in uh, poor working conditions in some regions of uh, China. Not because we wanted to, um, not because we feel they are particularly relevant today, but because they were relevant for the uh, first Basel Convention of 89, where the majority of countries of the world felt that it was time to legislate 
on the how electronic waste is handled after a public outcry uh, seeing those pictures and those journalistic reports. The Basel Convention was signed by the, a lot of countries of the world, the majority of countries in the world, and stated that countries uh, had to stop the exportations of electronic waste uh, out of their own countries and to handle it internally. Nevertheless, we all know that uh, when conventions like this are signed, they're basically um, just a list of very good intentions, and it took years before this became actually enforced as law, at least in the European uh, Union. Uh, for instance, Jim Packett, who is part of the Basel Action Network, and which is based in Seattle, he developed with MIT a sort of a GPS system that plugged in in discarded electronics could prove how in the United States a lot of these products are still shaped abroad to be recycled in poor working conditions, both for the, uh, for the laborer and dangerous for the environment. But in the process of research, and it was clear for us in this moment that what we were interested was in understanding if we as designers could do something to um, come up with a series of strategies to better design electronics products for first repair and in the second place recycling, we had to structure our research at least in three big chunks. The first one is analyzing how the formal recycling system works, the informal recycling system, and legislation, so the governance of uh, electronic waste. Of course, in our investigation, we want to include also the voices of producers, but they were the one that was uh, the least interested in engaging in conversation with us. Apart from Fujik Xerox, which was the only producer that responded to our request and hosted us in Thailand, um, in Bangkok, to see their recycling facilities. Their business model, we think it is quite avant-garde in the sense that you have to know that when we discard an electronic product, what happens is that it ends up in the recycling facilities and the object, even if components are still intact and working, it is shredded to recuperate materials out of it. Fujik Xerox, because they have a business-to-business -business model, they recuperate the printers and they own their recycling facilities. The components are dismantled and recuperated five times before they are then later shredded to produce, again, raw materials. And we engage in conversation because for us it was very much important that the research we were conducting was becoming more of a form of applied research. We uh, spoke with uh, recyclers dealing with cooling devices, with small electric appliances, and with digital devices. Just to clarify, ele um, electronic waste is any object that has an electric cable, a plug, or a battery, so not only computers or tablets and so on. And with NGOs establishing responsible recycling workshops in countries such as uh, India and in some regions of, of uh, Africa. Uh, regarding the governance, instead, we spoke with several practitioners, but between the others, the most useful for our research were definitely the European Electronic Recycling Association and uh, research at the United Nations University and Interpol, because international police is also responsible of uh, creating directives that are then delivered to, uh, for instance, the European Union that then creates other directives for uh, the different countries to be translated in uh, laws. One of the things that was very complex of the research process of our stream was to be able, when we were engaging in conversation, to somehow uh, obtain the information that was useful for our design process. And as I stated before, our aim was really to understand if we could come up with a series of strategies to design better electronic uh, products. And a tool we developed to converse, uh, especially with recyclers, were two videos, a disassembling and a form of taxonomy, where we disassemble a series of electronic products. And we systematically presented in this way so that we could more specifically speak about singular components within electronics. Recyclers tend to be very uh, proud of what they do, and they have difficulties in, uh, often in, in understanding what we were looking for, and these tools helped us in the conversation. The aim of, um, and the results of all this conversation were visualized in a uh, 3D rendering animation, and we thought of using the medium of 3D rendering because, of course, that's the tool that uh, industrial designers use the most 
to visualize possible products. And in this case, instead, we are visualizing strategies for uh, design. So if you can please play the first uh, video. I uh, will speak over it. So the, vid the video usually has a voiceover, but I would just mention some of the uh, strategies that we have been uh, putting forward. Our aim here was not really to be disruptive with the present industry, but rather to understand what is possible to do right now with the limitations of the industry. For instance, one of the things we came to uh, realize quite quickly is that, of course, as you, I guess you're all familiar, the majority of producers of electronics do not want citizens to be able to access their products. So in terms of repairing, it is very much important to be able to take apart components and be able to substitute them. For this reason, uh, we are advocating for the introduction of a uniform universal screwing system, which could be, uh, of course, definitely applied and would also help recyclers uh, when, in the case, they are living in countries that have less tools or technologies uh, available. So as you see with this example, we are not trying to, the, sort of the, our attitude is very pragmatic and very simple, still a strategies that could be applied today. Um, the selections of materials, of course, are very much uh, important. Miniaturizing uh, of components is becoming more and more problematic because, of course, glue is used to um, save space and glue, of course, is uh, becoming a problem because uh, components cannot be taken apart. And I will give you also an example, for instance, in washing machines. We got to learn that the concrete weight which is used to stabilize uh, washing machines often contains iron also to make it more heavy. But then eddy current, which is based on uh, magnetic uh, fields, is used to separate ferrous and non-ferrous materials. And then the concrete weight ends up, and ends up contaminating the wrong stream of waste. Or the top of washing machine is using often particles wood. But then when it is immersed in water, it absorbs water and it sinks together with ferrous metals, changing these materials will help the recycling process. I think there is also a huge problem with labeling. For instance, when you open electronic products, there is not correct labeling the state what is hazardous and what is not. And of course, this is a problem in case you want to personally adjust your own products, but also if you are uh, a laborer working in developing countries, often uh, it is the case you are not trained, and so you end up maybe handling in the uh, non-correct way, and it is dangerous both for you and for the environment. So adding labels would just solve, or not solve, but at least address this, this problem. Color, it seems uh, a very inoffensive element of design, can also become a problem. Electric cables are often coated in black rubber, but black rubber is very difficult to be recognized by visual detectors. So when electric cables covered in black are shredded, then coppers end up in the wrong stream of waste. So changing color would help the recycling of copper cables. And color would also be a good tool to be applied since visual detectors are used for the separations of components to create a clear color coding to separate the different uh, components in the process of recycling. Of course, in the um, animations, we listed a lot of others um, uh, uh, strategies, but these were just if you just mention the way we operated with it. But as you know, we, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the interest of the museum was not only to show a, a research process, but it was also to have a series of furniture pieces. And we thought that that was, in any case, an interesting request since objects can be, in the context of an exhibition, works as a good tool to. Um, having the audience engage with more complex uh, topics. But when we had to decide which kind of furniture to design, we decided to focus on office furniture, or at least to reference office furniture, because we feel there is a common ground or a similar attitude in the way the environment is um, apparently efficiently um, divided in subcategories of values, and it is um, mined, the materials are extracted and refined and circulated in an almost perfect system, and in the way the office has been designed at the end of the 60s, I'm thinking specifically at a cubicle, where it is again about uh, efficiency uh, of and productivity and divisions and partitions of different uh, elements of the uh, workforce. 
The office is also the place where all the bureaucracies that are uh, compiled to make uh, goods travels uh, in the world are uh, being compiled. At the National Gallery of Victoria, the objects and the videos were presented uh, together where we had uh, selections of the interviews we conducted, uh, the animations with the possible strategies, and the uh, objects which were produced with recycled metals but also included slightly grotesque elements um, that were rendering them apparently at, at first sight inoffensive and slightly more disturbing uh, when looked uh, closer uh, to them. And uh, we also plated some elements in gold, uh, sourcing it from recycled uh, circuit boards. When we presented the work at the uh, Triennale Milan uh, within Broken Nature, we decided to extend the work, but uh, focusing more on the videos than in the objects. And we added elements we thought were missing in the first presentation. For instance, this was a video using um, discarded electronics still functioning, um, displaying small clips that was clearly explaining what happened to a product when it is discarded. Basically, it was an infographic. And a short movie describing a, a very condensed uh, history of plant obsolescence started with the feeble cartel and the limitations of lifespan of electric bulbs. For the presentation there, we also decided to include a, what we call a visual essay, because we feel the, the oral streams became this very focused and almost narrow investigations into um, electronic waste. Nevertheless, our intentions as a studio when we started the project was much more to question the design industry uh, more at large. And we thought that with a more, I would say almost abstract, document we could address it on a more efficient way. And as part of the conclusions of my presentation, I would like to play the second clip, uh, which is a short uh, extract from the movie, which is 20 minutes long. Personal computers and mobile phones, but also through domestic appliances. Products like refrigerators, washing machines and ovens were once prized for their longevity and reliable performance, but manufacturers now fit them with digital interfaces and computer chips that require constant software and hardware updates. And to meet these demands, an increasing amount of gold, silver, and precious minerals are being excavated from the earth of developing countries, ending up in printed circuit boards in smart appliances. This demand has grown so colossal that the mining industry itself has been fundamentally altered. Mining no longer takes place underneath the surface of the planet, but also above ground. The majority of the planet's metal is migrating from ores found deep in the Earth's mantle to ingots stored in private warehouses or components embedded in building materials furniture, appliances, and exponentially multiplying electronic products. In turn, these metals also accumulate in electronic waste, the fastest growing waste stream on Earth. This abundance in waste has created a new industry of material recuperation, whose complexity increases in step with the technological sophistication of the discarded products. These objects are disassembled and recycled into metaphorical rivers of ore, which stream freely across the surface of the planet, as if through a continuous, borderless continent. New logistical infrastructures, technologies, and international alliances are forged to facilitate the recirculation of metals at the lowest cost. Antiquated colonial topographies assert themselves once more through an economic landscape of waste disposal and remining. The engine of this system is not well chartered or easy to visualize, but its effects occasionally manifest in poignant ironies. 
In the Congo, new cavities are excavated for gold, while the fields are covered with discarded electronics. As the sources of what Jason W. Moore has called cheap nature, developing countries are exploited twice, first for raw materials, and second for dumping grounds. 2018 Nearly 30 years after the adoption of an international convention on the transboundary movements of hazardous wastes, only 30% of the electronic devices purchased in the Western world end up in the appropriate recycling facilities. The remaining 70% is shipped abroad, often illegally, and recycled using inefficient and harmful processes that leave toxic components in the ground and create poisonous work conditions for laborers. A few countries are beginning to ban such irresponsible exportation out of their borders and creating legislature to enforce appropriate recycling channels. However, the issue is almost exclusively tackled through the post hoc instrument of law. But the problem can also be understood as a question of design a potential for change that has been largely ignored, not only by lawmakers, but equally by designers and engineers. While they focus only on the retooling and miniaturization of electronic components, they remain ignorant of the complications they are creating for the recycling process. Consumers are kept passive, lacking the required knowledge or tools to understand and influence the system. Their electronic purchases are distributed without assembly guides, and standardized screws and connectors are substituted with customized components to prevent tinkering and repair. Some alternatives have been tested. First launched in 2013, the Fairphone is manufactured under fair labor conditions without the use of conflict minerals, and uses modules that can be repaired and upgraded separately. Meanwhile, Fuji Xerox has set up their own recycling facilities to recuperate printer components up to five times before they are shredded in order to be processed into raw materials. Recycling is an important action, but it is a short-term solution Inevitably, the relation between production, consumption, and disposal must be drastically reformed based on a new definition of the metric of efficiency. Waste, in fact, is no more than a theoretical construct within a hyper-capitalist value system. There is no objective distinction between a new, shiny product and unwanted trash nor any real separation between technological device and human body. Matter is in a state of constant flux. Our bodies deteriorate and decompose, feeding the growth of other organisms. Matter bonds, separates, and transforms. It never appears out of nothing, nor disappears into nothing. Design can play a role. It is not just about shaping materials, but investigating and guiding what happens before that moment and from that point onwards. It can be a tool to limit and heal the damage caused by its needs, rather than a mechanism to invent new desires and immediately frustrate them. As Tim Ingold says, Materials do not exist. Rather, as substances in becoming, they carry on or perdure, forever overtaking the formal destinations that, at one time or other, have been assigned to them, and undergoing continual modulation as they do so. Left to themselves, however, materials can run amok, pots are smashed, bodies disintegrate, it takes effort and vigilance to keep things intact, 
whether they be pots or people. So um, I thought of showing um, this clip also because it, for us the, the video was also an occasion to um, almost making collide all the different elements of the research and the furniture we use, which they became almost props in the in the in the video and to address as i mentioned before some of the issues we're looking into from a more holistic perspective and uh, as a conclusion also of the commissions that we got from the triennale in milan we thought it was important to use part of their uh, budget available to uh, do a website which is called orestreams.com which is structured in three very simple pages an intro or a stream which is where we collected all the outcomes um, such as the interviews, the videos, the objects, etc., and an archive which is collecting a selections of the documents and things we have been reading to investigate electronic waste. For us, this is a way to make it also available for others, and it has a very simple um, tag system to divide the different contents. Thank you. Thank you so much, You're Simone. Welcome. Now. Um, I had a whole lot of questions I wanted to ask, but I scrapped them because uh, you somehow answered them. Now, of course, it's always smart to say that because if the question that I end up asking is a bad question, then everyone will say, hey, he, he, he came up with it on the spot. But if it turns out to be a good one, people will say, wow, I can't believe he came up with that. So uh, I wanted to just uh, come back to your quote, which which I quoted once and then which reappears in the end of the film um, where it, it um, where you state um, where you talk quite um, kind of um, earnestly about what design what what role uh, design can play and I thought maybe I would just kind of go back to that for one for one last time um, and I, I wanted to start by saying that you know I love this quote as much as I do the work but um, I can't help but find uh, attention within it as I do within the work you know there's such a wide range that you seem to be proposing here from the kind of the IC commentary of the objects themselves to the kind of the more minute improvements to reuse and recycling that you mm -hmm. kind of go through in, 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 in the in the film and in the lecture um, but then I guess my question is, um, how far up can you go? Because if you go all the way up the line, then it seems that what you're potentially proposing is something like a planned economy. Uh, and am I right? I mean, uh, this, no. <laughs> uh, this aspect that, that uh, kind of every aspect of the design pro process could somehow be controlled and that, you know, somehow the price of, for example, the object's disposal will somehow be incorporated into the price of the object no so um, so and and you know and then I, I realized that you know this is probably not precisely what you are proposing and that um, that and and it, it kind of made me think about um, the film um, you know the recent uh, series Chernobyl. Uh, I don't know if anyone has seen that. Have you seen it? I've seen the first episode. But I mean, I even if you haven't seen it, so. I mean, we don't need to see it because it, it happened, you know, so uh, and, and what was very interested in that show and, you know, this is great because this is happening also in the co within the context of a planned economy where the great thing about this is that, you know, no one really seems to know the relationship between one thing and the next. Because mm -hmm. of that, that's where the kind of the, the whole uh, thing explodes because mm -hmm. And what, what you seem to be proposing is that the designer should be able to kind of step into each, uh, each spot along the process somehow, into the process of extraction, into the process of uh, recycling, into the process of uh, reuse, into the pro and into the process of legislation, and that that is kind of what you're laying uh, yeah. on the table here. I mean, and I'm, I'm wondering, where do you think... Uh, so, First of all, I think it is important that as designers we are more aware of that, at least. So I think what we find problematic of the discipline is that somehow we are often asked to step in in a process and to accept how um, the, the grid that you're working in it has been designed. And for us, a project like Aura Streams is a way of investigating where resources are coming from, where they are going, and where design play a role. So I think 
the work is more or less trying to problematize the position of design more than anything else. Um, one of the elements that we think is unresolved of the work, or one of the various elements are unresolved, is of course that in this moment, for instance, we decided to focus on recycling, which we are very much aware that recycling as it's another industry. It's simply like a, a fragment of a very complex economic structure that we are not undermining, of course, if we take care of recycling. Nevertheless, uh, we believe that design can intervene on multiple levels, and also there are different kinds of urgencies, in a way. So when you observe, for instance, electronic waste and how it is managed, there is an urgency to make that industry more responsible, for instance. And I think that's what we were trying to do with Aura Streams. Let's say that we, when we started looking into it, it was so evident that a certain kind of thinking wasn't in place and that there is a lack of communications, for instance, between uh, engineering uh, teams, designers, producers, recyclers, and lawmakers, that there is an evident uh, space for improvement there. And that's what we were trying to do with Aura Streams, despite as a project, it speaks much more to a uh, um, to designers than to lawmakers, for instance. So also how the project is conceived in terms of its visual language and study, it communicates to a very specific group of people. And I think that is something we should improve to also think about how where the work can, can travel beyond ourselves and beyond the public that we're speaking to. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was fascinating to learn that I don't think I had the kind of the, the timeline correct in my head, so I think I thought it was, to me, watch, viewing the kind of the main, what do, you, what do you call it, film essay or whatever you call it, yeah, I mean, sure. there it seems like the whole project is almost there from the start. It's very interesting yeah. to hear that it starts with the objects that almost seem like they kind of stretch out, there's like a space that's stretched out between the objects on the one hand and let's say the archive that you, uh, yeah. that you give us on the website that seems to be like on the one hand a kind of a very, very practical kind of set of tools and a very kind of uh, critical commentary, let's say, yes. or something like that. And in between that, there's kind of a spectrum of things that you're trying to make available. Yes, indeed. I think that in a way it is a, for us this was a very, important body of work, but it was it is also a very unresolved body of work in the sense that it is the first time that we are really trying to shift a design studio and to more pragmatically, let's say, have an agenda. In this case, it was really to observe an industry first mm -hmm. and to understand if there are changes we can suggest. Um, but still, the project has different attitudes, different ways of operating, also because of how it was framed by the commissioner. Mm -hmm. So, it, maybe an interesting aspect of the work is that it has all the complexities and the problematics, but also the possibilities of the design discipline in this moment. How it is framed by institutions, how it is conceived by the market, and um, we'll, we will have to see how as a design studio we can take this forward. For instance, we are working on something right now which is a closer observation to the timber industry. And definitely, at least in the first installment, we will not present any product. And it will become much more just simply the display of a research process. Um, one of the way we see our work going forward is to also make it as part of an educational program. I'm not sure I replied. To no, your that's question, a very honestly. no. It's a great. Uh, that's a. It's a great response. And I. I, I was also. Uh, we'll move up, move on to Jonah soon. I just uh, one response to that was um, because a couple of weeks ago we saw, for example, um, Amy Siegel's work. I don't know if you're uh, uh, familiar with that, but um, what I'm she sure was very much. Uh, quick synopsis. Sorry, is, is uh, the film. We watched this film called Quarry, and it's about the first half of the film. We see a quarry and kind of marble the dumbest of materials being kind of quarried out of the ground. And then on the other hand, on the other half of the film, we see this marble kind of miraculously reappearing in the kind of the, 
show Manhattan showrooms. But what she was very much concerned with was kind of saying, doing something a little bit similar to what you just said, which was like not kind of critiquing or, or kind of exposing a process, but more like almost performing the process or something like that, you know, as, as, if, as if you couldn't go outside of uh, the kind of the art, art market system, but somehow making the work kind of speak that language. But I, I was wondering how your work related to that, and I feel like you, you kind of are able to do somehow both, you know, this is not meant as a critique to Amy's work, but, but that there is like a, there is both the kind of the way that the objects in this, in the in the exhibition, they kind of perform this kind of the, the, this kind of institutional critique. But at the same time, there's a also quite earnest uh, attempt to to the the objects are the most complex things there because they are very uh, also ambiguous by nature because they're not meant to illustrate the proposals we put in place, but they are actually more reflecting on some of the things we have been looking to from an aesthetic perspective. So the questions were much more, let's say, almost formal and slightly a bit more less pragmatic. We had a completely less pragmatic approach and we let ourselves definitely be guided by the physicalities of materials also. And, and they're grotesque, like what you said. Yeah. I mean, I thought that was a pretty great word, too. Yeah. yeah. I, I think a lot of people don't see them as grotesque, they just see them as very beautiful. But that doesn't matter. At least, I think they always have this feeling of, let, let's say that what we were striving for is to have these objects which they look and they perform as perfect objects with these shiny, pretty surfaces. We. When we had to decide the colors, for instance, we look at the palette of colors of macarons. <laughs> we really wanted to have something very banal in its prettiness, mm -hmm. and and then adding other elements which are sort of weird or apparently weird, mm -hmm. but they bind them together in a narrative which is a bit more uh, complex and a bit they ref reference back to that thing that um, the reference to Tim Ingold at the end of the movie where it says that basically materials are in constant transformation and um, you don't really know what you're looking at, really, when you look at the objects. Nevertheless, when they are presented together with a body of work like this, they become, um, I guess, a bit problematic. I would almost say it would be better to present the objects mm -hmm. and right. the other work, mm -hmm. the separated elements, but we never had enough space to sort of divide them because I think they do different things, mm -hmm. uh, which is probably the, one of the critiques I have of the work that we do too many things all together. But being all over the place is also a good way to start. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I, I guess the question that I'd like to ask um, is on some level a kind of meta critique. Uh, so I'll just launch into it. I, I, um, I mentioned before we started uh, a book by the architectural historian Daniel Abramson uh, called Obsolescence and Architectural History, which I um, made available to, to some of the students in my group. Um, but uh, I'll just cite uh, the, in the last chapter, which is called Sustainability and Beyond. Um, he asks the kind of larger scale question, what meanings from the history of obsolescence can be applied to efforts at sustainability today? So the, the book is about obsolescence in general uh, in the history of architecture, mostly in the 20th century, but um, the thesis of the last chapter is basically that uh, sustainability has made the paradigm of obsolescence itself obsolete. Um, and uh, so he asks, uh, he, he argues, uh, that through the concept of obsolescence, and I'll quote here, hazard was tamed, contingency made manageable, even profitable, and in today's world, the rhetoric of sustainability has supplanted obsolescence by, quote, offering slow adaptability and circular conservation, but also demonstrating sustainability to be a tool of capital, that is, it's inherently conservative. Um, and he writes, depending upon machine and managerial innovations to equilibri equilibrate change, green engines and preservation protocols, at the same time, sustainability is promoted 
as an economic growth machine to support capital capitalist accumulation. So applying that critique to your work, um, I would just sort of, uh, I, I guess it caused me to reflect upon the, 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 the sort of um, propositions that you proffer, specifically in the design strategies video, which is a collection of should statements. Legislation should be made to do this, we yeah. should do this, we should do this next thing, right? Um, and the, so the question that I'm, that I'm sort of aiming at here is um, it seems as though there's a kind of accommodation that uh, in the entire body of work that you asked us to, to watch, there's a notion that we're going to continue to produce this waste. So how can we mitigate the damage that it, uh, that, that it um, somehow uh, will be its byproduct, right? Whereas I guess my question is, um, wouldn't there be a more radical proposition that would force us to question and change our behaviors. Um, in other words, despite the best of intentions, that you might be actually enabling a maintenance of the status quo, the behaviors that yeah. we've grown accustomed to. Yeah, indeed. I, um, when we decided to put forward those um, proposals for the recycling of products, we were starting from the awareness that, as I mentioned before, even recycling itself is a part of an economic system and it's just like, um, even the concept itself of waste is the outcome of a capitalist system that says like this has value and this has no value. Nevertheless, there are things that need to, to be addressed sort of now and things that need to be addressed today in the afternoon. <laughs> And I think the work is not a, is not doing what it's not doing is proposing a total transformation of the way design is applied, but also the way economy is conceived. I do agree that um, sustainability as a concept has been totally assimilated by um, the way we conceive the economy uh, today, and new, more radical way of thinking must arise. I think we hint to that at the end of the, um, of the video we presented before, but it's yet not out there, our own uh, proposal. Um, nevertheless, I think inevitably, the only way to uh, have a radical change is of course thinking of a completely different economic system. And while of course the designer I don't have the, the ability to do that. We hope in the future as a design studio to, um, to be more radical in that respect. For instance, uh, I was mentioning before in this moment we are working on a project that is about, at least in this stage, it's a form of observation of the timber industry, which means everything and nothing when I say timber industry, but nevertheless, basically the sourcing of materials from a forest uh, for the productions of timber, there are some ethical questions that arise, for instance, from the fact that you're dealing with a living species, a tree, that would probably help us to move forward to a more sort of a radical perspective in, in how to conceive, which is impossible to have, a less anthropocentric perspective of design, which I'm saying it's impossible because, of course, by nature, design is anthropocentric. It's the most anthropocentric uh, discipline existing on the planet. Um, but it's what we are striving as a design studio, but we don't have, of course, any solution yet. And I'm not sure who will have solutions, but that's what we're interested in to investigate in the near future. Maybe we could take questions from the audience. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you about how important as a designer is it to uh, to show the context, like to make it uh, visible, the context. Like I've seen the in the Fondation Cartier the object and the volcano, um, the, the furniture made from the volcano mm -hmm. in, in Milan. I was wondering if it was important, the context. Um, yeah. Or not. Yeah, well, for us it is definitely important in the sense that 
no matter what we do, there is a context for it. And when we produce things, they come from a place, they originate in a place, they relate to it. And um, I think that's the most interesting part in a design discipline in this moment is to actually look much more con on a contextual level how we operate as designers and also where we source materials. Maybe it is just, uh, we are pretty obsessed with it, but it's just that we think it is where the most interesting and radical changes could happen if you closely observe to a context from where something originated. I think for a long time, as designers, we operated almost in a vacuum, you know? I think it probably it is due to the fact that designers always operated departing from an idea that we are supposed to serve human needs. And human needs then became uh, synonymous of desires. And if my role is ful fulfilling those needs, I don't necessarily, I can, I can also overlook how I get there, basically. It, it might be an oversimplification, but I think that's often what is happening. Also, as designers, we often operate uh, based on specific commissions that are not asking us to be critical of the context where we operate. And I find that problematic. It's also why as a design studio, we are trying to more and more to uh, establish our discipline between more a more commercial practice and a more, let's say, research-based and a more critical one, because we see that it's the merging of the two is sadly almost impossible. And so the only way to operate in this pro moment is probably to radicalize the two positions. So to work commercially and to work completely non-commercially, almost radical, on a radical level. Uh, I don't know where that will lead us, but I think rarely a good connections between the, the two parts seems to happen in this moment. We uh, uh, we saw that the furniture that you designed is also available for uh, at least on the site. It's available for uh, to, for you to buy it. So uh, is this something that what you said now trying to to assemble this kind of critical thinking with uh, the commercial uh, side of practice and or and what do you how do you see like the commercialization of this? Furniture that itself has a political agenda. Do you see it as the act of putting it for sale as well as a yeah. political agenda? And also, uh, if it is for sale, is it, is it the, just the object that was on the display, or is it like made to order or uh, produced? Yeah. So the objects are available through a gallery, so they are sold as um, um, like art objects, basically. Um, that's how it is, basically. <laughs> we uh, we accept the fact that they are a commodity, and um, they have different forms. They, they have different nature, um, and our work have different um, way of operating. Nevertheless, when we conceive the object, that's not absolutely what we were thinking. So th this example is not of the or strains work is not anything like what I just said in a sense that it was originated from a commission from a museum it was supposed to stay like that and then it became um a larger edition of objects which is sold basically as art pieces but it was definitely not part of our agenda or part of our aim when we started the work. The work, as I explained, started as a commission that we sort of twisted in a way that was interesting for the studio. And the objects were an occasion to respond to a commission, but at the same time to look on an aesthetic level how to address some of the things we were talking about with the rest of the work. Hi. Um, we have uh, heard uh, a lot about uh, recycling, and um, some would argue that the recycling industry is a millionaire industry. Is that sorry? A, a millionaire industry, 
Um, what do you think about uh, reducing the use of electronic devices rather than only uh, recycling or yeah. reusing? Yeah. So the part of the mm, there is a part in the animation that I mentioned before that is also addressing the needs of repair, which is, it comes first. Um, actually, the right of repair that it comes first. The, the recycling. Uh, interestingly, if what you need to well repair something is uh, almost the same things you need to well recycle something. So they share similar, the repair nece necessities shares very similar um, elements to the recycling one. Um, the reason why we focus more extensively in the recycling, and I agree with you, it is a millionaire industry, is because specifically also with electronic waste, there's a lot of things that needs to be done, not really to be more efficient, but at least to be more responsible. So in this moment, there's uh, still materials that are exported in the same developing countries where uh, minerals are extracted. And also because uh, in any case, no matter intellectually how we see economy developing, uh, at least you are going to mine less from the underground if recycling is becoming more and more efficient. Is this solution? No. Repairing is definitely the first step that should be there. And we addressed it um, at the beginning of the animation once we extended it for the Triennale in Milan because we were aware that was a very vital um, an important element, also because it is the best way to challenge also how companies establish their own business model, which is, of course, it is still based on obsolescence and not, for instance, on repair, which is a completely different idea. I guess, though, I, one of the questions that remains for me um, out of all of this is it seems to me that um, there are two, well, the larger question is um, how do you address ethics in in the kind of um, in your production, um, and so what I mean by that is that it seems as though there's a kind of unreconciled tension here between, on the one hand, your kind of ecumenicism towards what counts, what is waste, what counts as a valued object. Um, the constructedness or contingency of, of values, right? So this would be, um, you know, the, that, um, that, you know, the Tim Ingold, that what we understand to be waste um, is, is contingent on our, you know, the shiny object doesn't have inherent value in itself, all of those, that line of thinking. Um, on the other hand, you also emphasize this question, or the, the kind of um, the imperative towards uh, what Alex was asking about in, in terms of efficiency, repair, that these are things that we need to do, right? And embedded in that idea of efficiency is a set of values, right? That, that um, let's say, uh, is anything but contingent, right? So I guess I, I just wonder how you pull those two concepts together? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if we pull them together. <laughs> That's okay. a, yeah. And I realize that there is a, a tension there, but we haven't been able to find another way of operating. Or, or it's almost as if we see that uh, there are different scales and times of intervention almost. And there are sort of things that I don't see it I see there is no other way than addressing them according to the present system. And then parallel to that, there should be sort of efforts in coming up with alternatives to it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't see that we can, I don't see ourselves as a design studio, but also as a practice, I don't see design sort of um, being the ultimate discipline that can disrupt completely a system. He can observe it, he can criticize it, but at the same time sort of um, react to it still. Yeah, I guess um, 
the, what, I, what I hear you describing is uh, a kind of tension on some level maybe between um, a kind of conceptual reconciliation that maybe isn't necessary to perform when in fact what your what you see as your mandate is really just to kind of practice. Would yes. that be fair? Yeah, I think it is fair. I think okay. it is fair. Hi. My question is, do you think uh, recycling, especially in architecture, is always the best solution? I mean, for example, in Europe or in Milan, sometimes buildings become obsolete, right? And it has maybe a higher cost in, with the environment uh, to just preserve them or recycle them instead of turning them apart. So I was thinking, what is your position in recycling in architecture? I mean, of course, I'm not an architect, so I, I'm not really aware of it. But nevertheless, I think that there's multiple ways that a building can be uh, recycled. Um, I think that I do like the idea that humans adapt to a building more than buildings adapting to humans. Uh, what I mean to say is that I think there's a lot of um, attempt in, or there's a lot of people that think that the only way is sort of disrupting some, or destroying completely something to start the new. And I, and I think the humans have so much ability to adapt to a context that I don't see, even in architecture, that as a huge necessity. Uh, then in terms of what is best for the environment, I guess it depends on the singular case studies. I mean, honestly, there's, I don't know any rule that is applicable equally throughout different systems, so. Hi, thank you for Hi. your presentation. Um, for me, it was very impressive to understand from the video visual essay that a small daily use object is connected to different regions, ways of extraction, production, and local communities. Um, so every object is very loaded with amounts of information that we rarely see and we are not even conscious. Um, do you think technology and design should be improving everybody's quality of life, but is this really happening? Or finally, uh, the, there is a giant discrimination in destruction, production, consumption cycle from who is being benefited and who is not? Do you think this is related to power or money? Uh, what do you suggest uh, should happen among politics and economic spheres to revert this? And finally, uh, regarding to, your, to a designer's practice, um, what ethic measures uh, should we as designers pursue when designing? So I think I will have to ask you to repeat the questions one by one. Ah, okay. And I'm, I'm sure I will not sort out the problems of humanity today. <laughs> But nevertheless, I think that, uh, let me think. Um, I think I forgot half of your <laughs> questions. Uh, you asked, uh, the first question was. Was that uh, in, the, in the cycle of yes. extraction, production, and consumption? Uh, not everybody in, this, art, in yes. this cycle is being benefited. Yeah. So do you think there's yes. like a correlation? D definitely, I mean, honestly, I, I still find bizarre when people still talk about democratic design because, of course, we know <laughs> design is democratic for a limited group of people. Um, we, I still do think that design is about improving the life of people. I think it's not enough anymore. I think it should be uh, about humans and other species too. Um, and I think that would be the biggest challenge forward. I think design has placed the needs of humans at the center basically forever, and in this respect, that's probably the most critical point of design. If you think about even the charts of how, you know, a lot of famous design educations, you know, the humans are always placed at the center, and then design as a, as a discipline that reacts to the needs of humans. But in a moment like this one, where the ecological disaster is upon us, it is already happening, how can we still talking only about the well-being of humans, for instance, when we know that the main idea of ecology is that there is an entanglement between species that is vital for survival 
on the planet. So this is another element that, that should be reformed within design discipline. I'm not sure we will be the one doing that, but uh, it, is, it is definitely to be considered. And of course, well, your question was also about um, who is responsible for this, right? Did you? Uh, or, or I think you answered me that. The, the, but yeah. for example, we as designers, uh, what kind of ethics yeah. uh, should we pursue when we are designing? Yeah. For example, what um, commissions we do we need to take, and which yeah. ones, for example, do it's we need to reject? Good question. Very good questions. Um, we really ha we really struggle with the ethical components of our own practice, but it's also the things we like the most. Also, because it make it, f we are faced daily with the what we are willing to do and not as also as individuals. We always feel, me and Andrea, that we have more responsibilities as designers than singular human beings. That I know it seems a paradox, but we feel a bit like those doctors that. Of course, it should suggest people not to smoke uh, if your patient is suffering from cancer, but maybe they are still smoking uh, when they are home. And sometimes we do feel like that. I mean, I think there is a higher responsibility when you practice um, your own discipline. And I don't know which are the set of ethics you should apply in your own work. I think it is up to you, honestly. I think that and the we, we came to term, for instance, in our own studio on how we handled that, more or less, which is like looking at the economy of the studio, how much we are able to pay the people in the studio, uh, and limiting as much as possible the internships or making sure they are being paid, and what do I need to do that, to pay that, for instance. It's just a simple, uh, these are some of the questions that are happening within the studio, and then there are, the ethical questions when you address a work, and but inevitably I don't have I don't have an answer because I think you, you should come out with your own sort of ethical questions. I guess in any case the way we structure our own practice is a lot about investigating which are the limits and the responsibility of the discipline, and I'm saying limits because since we operate not in an academic context but we have a design studio, we are also faced to do honestly some pretty stupid works. And even there, when we do these stupid works, we try to at least have a decent conversation with the commissioners or try to rethink the, the commission they propose us and, and so on. Uh, or to redirect the economy that comes out of that, um, of that commission for the studio itself. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, I don't know the limits of your practice, so I'm only responding to the or streams. Um, it's just a question, like, who do you imagine is the audience of your work? And how does that relate to the forms of representation that you, that you used? Yeah. So since the work was a commission from a uh, public institution and museum, it was interested in, in displaying the work within an exhibition. Of course, the design-related audience was the people we were speaking to. Nevertheless, honestly, and I know this will probably sounds very selfish, but we always consider ourselves the main audience. Not because we are so arrogant that we like to say in our studio and designing for us, but because we hope that if we find something interesting for us and it communicates to us what we want to do, it will also do to others. Um, we are aware that, for instance, with the oral streams, we did an effort, for instance, in documenting the interviews we conducted, and we tried to collect more precisely and with a bit more rigor the research we've done to possibly make it available to a larger group of people. Um, and I think this will become more and more part of our work, which is developing work in such a way that reflects our own practice, but at the same time produce a research which can be distributed or at least made available to a larger group. 
one of the things we are doing, for instance, in, in this moment is drafting a more simple document, think like a simple PDF to give back to the people we have been uh, interrogating with some of the questions we had in the process of research because we realized that um, they find sort of the visual presentation of putting in the sense that whatever they see something pretty they think it's not serious <laughs> so <laughs> we will have to degrade the quality of our designs to make sure people will listen hi uh, good afternoon um, I wanted to ask you about I don't see you. oh I'm here <laughs> I, um, I know that you give lessons in university um, and I was my question is more regarding the education of these um, like being conscious about these topics so how do you think institutions um, should educate students and how us as students should be educated on these topics uh, yeah. more regarding that um, so we are involved with different educations uh, in Eindhoven Design Academy, but teachers within other departments. And from next 2020, we will also have our own department. And in uh, Sicily, we started a bachelor program for the local students that cannot afford to travel abroad, Sicily, uh, out of Sicily to study. Um, I think that what actually it is missing in the design discipline in this moment is the observation of not only the power but also the limitations and the problematics of the design discipline in itself. What I mean to say is that there's a lot of uh, lecture series and programs that sort of promote the amazing things design can do. But on the other side, I think it is also important to focus on the terrible things design can do and the um, establish an education course which would help students to create a much more, to, to grow a much more critical perspective towards how they operate and to help them uh, developing a set of ethical references for their own practice. Um, at least this is something we will try to, to do when we will establish our own departments in, uh, in Eindhoven. And um, yes, that's it. Hi. Hi. Uh, mine is more like a comment. Um, I really like when you say, um, in the video says, developing countries are exploited twice for the raw materials and the waste. And um, I wanted to add maybe one more with a third, because in developing countries, the access for repair, uh, it is more difficult. So like, um, what do you say, like manufacturers should guarantee the possibility of repair. So these developing countries are exploited uh, three times because we don't have uh, the access for repair. So then that is the waste. To it, I have to say, honestly, I think repairing is happening much more in, um, I mean, I hate to use developing countries as a word, but that's uh, uh, the one I use. Um, because they, honestly, their uh, components are reused much more and they are not just shredded often at least, not always, to recuperate um, raw materials, at least for in, case of, in the case of electronics. But yes, I agree with you. And also something that was very banal and obvious, but what I thought was interesting is when I was looking into, with Andrea, into the, the problematics of recycling, it is ob absolutely obvious how the products are conceived to be sold globally, but are designed, keeping in mind a very specific local context of based on wealth and privilege. And um, it was also very interesting in any case that if you start observing something very close and you apply certain sort of more 
critical perspective into a problem, you realize that if you design something very well for repair, you will so solve out a lot of troubles also for recycling, which I thought that was particularly interesting. What I mean to say is that um, there, there is a lot of improvement that can be done in how things are designed, as long as we abandon a cliche idea of what innovation is. And innovation is the first um, tool for um, the bus of the economy in, at the end of the day, because it is used as a, way, as a tool to create new things, basically constantly. But the, the idea of innovation is also based on a very old-fashioned concept, which is much closer to what what um, what we all as consumers think we want. I mean, how many pixels do we need a camera to have? Do you know what I mean? I find it that hilarious. Our eye cannot even see that resolution anymore. What do we do with that? And I find this incredibly interesting that we're all buying in this concept of innovation, for instance where um, electronics are becoming thinner and thinner, and I'm wondering where they, are they supposed to go? Why is it thinner better if then you cannot separate components, if I cannot access it? So I think it is also interesting to see how, even on an aesthetic level, there are some concepts that are completely bizarrely there because they serve an economic um, paradigm more than anything else. Hello. Yeah. So um, I found your work very interesting. I found it a little apocalyptic. So I just wanted to ask you if you have an optimistic view or conclusion about this research that you're doing. Well, I don't think it was apocalyptic, maybe because you've seen the videos. I think we were trying to be not apocalyptic by proposing even very simple, banal things that we can do now, because indeed, indeed, it is very difficult to be a designer today, and maybe that attempt to be sort of um, in proposing solutions in a very, it's a bit of an old fashioned modernist approach in a way. Um, it was a way to avoid to go fully apocalyptic. I think also in the way we, we actually, I really don't agree <laughs> because I think we put a lot of effort also in the visuals we use in the way we constructed the aesthetic of the work to avoid to have a glamorizing of dystopia, which we really care about that because enough of that, you know, like uh, enough with Black Mirror. I mean, <laughs> um, that kind of, I find that very problematic how um, that disasters is upon us can be easily, beautifully be represented and, and fulfill an idea of sublime, which is, I think, not working anymore. Thank you so much for your presentation and being here. Uh, my question is, uh, you try to demonstrate uh, the relationship between material and uh, human knowledge. Uh, uh, in a way that narrates the past and the present. Uh, how do you picture the future uh, in terms of technology, innovation, and design, uh, the relationship between uh, material, the product, and uh, human? It's a very broad question. Uh, how do I vision the development? Is it a question how I vision the development of yeah. design and technology? In the future? As, yeah, you, you try to demonstrate uh, material and human knowledge yes. in your, uh, the past and now the current one. So how do you, as, as a person who are uh, doing research in, in this area, in this, in this discipline, how do you picture the future of technology, yeah. material, and the, the future of technology, I don't know, because I have the feeling it will sort of continue in the past that it is nowadays, but I hope at least the future of knowledge will 
develop on a much more interdisciplinary way and much more and I go back maybe to the questions about education, much less um, I, I, don't, I think I don't believe in the idea of uh, thinking education in terms of a way of, of making a person a professional that performs in, in, in a, a specific profession. And so I hope that knowledge will develop in a much more humanistic perspective of the different knowledges that come together because I think that's the probably only way to look forward even for technological development that actually makes sense because the one of the things we experienced looking into uh, ore streams and sub after it strangely enough not strangely actually good enough we have been connected by a, an electronic producers of phones and tablets and stuff like that and we thought they were interesting in the work we were developing they were totally not they were really not interested of any of the things we were talking about but it was in any case an interesting thing to to look into their company because it was evident how their the structure of the company is totally fragmented so that nobody that works within it can have an holistic view of the product you're actually developing and I find that a very interesting way of developing a company because it it, uh, it is about uh, splitting knowledge in, in little fragments so that nobody is, is taking responsibility of what is produced at the end basically which I think it is a very uh, illuminating um, at least for us it was an illuminating experience uh, to uh, to be able to look that up close so in a way if that respond to your questions I hope that this way of fragmenting knowledge will sort of if not come to an end but it will be um, less dominant in the future, at least within education. Okay, so I, I do agree with you that we don't need uh, smaller Good. phones or uh, like 20 megapixels, but is that question directed to, to us as consumers or to the big tech companies? Because you know, like Apple, like last year or the year, be year before, they released an update that impaired or slowed down a lot of phones. Mm -hmm. So we were forced to upgrade and buy the new one. So what can we do? Yeah, I still have an iPhone 5, and somebody else in the room have an iPhone 4. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you can still handle the- 4S. 4S. <laughs> um, it's the first person in the world I meet that has a phone older than mine, which I'm very happy <laughs> I found one. Um, so, so um, your question was if it is a question for citizens or for uh, producers. Well, I guess it is a question for both. Um, I think it is a question for both. Yeah, I think that, of course, for instance, I think that it it would totally be doable to for a, a gigantic company like Apple to structure their business model around the idea of repair. They could totally do that. I'm, I'm confident with that. Would that be a solution? No, but it would definitely be better how it is nowadays. I think they will also be forced to do that. They recently stated that their um, recent products will be more and more focused on being long lasting. And I think it is also the outcome of uh, um, pushes in legislation uh, at least that I'm aware of in, in Europe for limiting the damages of uh, plant obsolescence. So I think uh, Apple is, is basically um, stating the obvious basically when they say that because they're basically forced to address durability now. But I wonder if, if we could sort of expand that question again to the, to the larger field of valuing systems, which is to say, I think there's a kind of um, notion embedded in some of these questions that says that uh, the, if the product is really, really well designed, then it will last longer, and that's a good thing. And I guess I would just, I, I, I wonder um, how we assess that kind of, um, like, better equals longer lasting 
again, uh, in terms of the kind of larger system of values that that implies? Well, considering how everything in this moment is based on obsolescence, uh, at least if it is not on a technological level, even on aesthetic obsolescence, I think necessarily in this moment, durability is a disruptive concept. Yeah. Because inevitably it pushes for a complete reform of the way um, growth is conceived upon, which is based on, on, on uh, limiting durability. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to sort of um, gesture towards the, the idea that the Ore Streams project has this entire section called archive, <laughs> which is all about collection and you know yeah. accretion and somehow you yeah. know retaining material, right? Yeah. Material of a different sort. That's all yeah. Different set no, that was a really like when um, we were really looking forward to do that because. The a lot of the things we have been doing in the studio was actually sort of looking into all these materials and we feel it is important to find a place where they can be collected. Yeah. Uh, I was recently speaking with a journalist that deals with um, sustainable development in companies, um, but he was uh, actually really passionate about his, his uh, work. And he, f is, he was, for instance, mentioning how it is very difficult to find places where sort of knowledges from different sectors come together, which is in a way what we were trying to do with oral streams, just out of out of our own interest, not not as an agenda. But it's becoming probably more and more of an agenda because we realize how vital that is. Uh, hi. We were Maybe just talking about the last question. Last question yeah. Oh we were just talking about the Apple devices. Products um, and I noticed that you show your video in your video. You show the the videos in in all Apple devices. Yes. I wonder whether it is uh, like a sarcastic implication that it is unrecyclable yeah. or unrepairable. Yeah. They are all uh, computers we have in the studio, so it goes back to what we said at the beginning. We thought it the to the focus on electronic waste at one point became also re relevant for us because of how much these objects shape our practice. So in a way, the video is a gigantic m meta work in the sense that it's about observing the work we do with the, uh, with the objects we use daily on top of the objects we design it. So the, the, the video was conceived to be like that, almost like this Russian doll structure of a thing. Uh, all right, I think we will wrap up for today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you. you.